Well, today is the second Sunday of Advent, and the theme for today is, is peace. Last week, when Ron Jr. spoke, the theme was hope, and today is peace. And for our text today, I want to first turn to Isaiah chapter 9. One of the most famous messianic passages in the entire Old Testament. But if you would, I would also keep a thumb in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be going there as well. Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to be beginning at the second verse and reading through the seventh verse. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. <clears throat> you have increased the nation and enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. <clears throat> he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with, righteous, with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Dear God, and I thank you for your word, these prophecies from thousands of years ago that Jesus fulfilled. I thank you that he came. I thank you that we have the freedom and the opportunity to celebrate it and even tell other people about it still. Thank you for all of your blessings this Advent time, including the blessing of a son of my own. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's a question for you. What is peace, anyway? The Strategic Air Command the part of the Air Force that delivered nuclear weapons, took as their motto, peace is our profession. They saw their job as not making war, but preventing war. And they did a pretty good job for some 50 or 60 years. But I have to tell you, that kind of peace is fragile. 79 years ago tonight, people went to bed in the United States on a Sunday evening at Advent season. And they were completely untroubled by what had been going on in Europe for three years. And they woke up the next morning to this. Fred, Elmer, do you remember that morning? That Sunday morning in 1941? Yep, that was our nation's reminder that peace is fragile. And we've spent the next four years without peace. So, can we bring in our own peace ourselves? Do you remember this symbol from the 60s? How much peace did that bring to our society? How about this kind of peace? Mostly peaceful protests. The city is burning down, but it was mostly peaceful. Well, how about this? Does peace come from the government? The Romans tried that with their Pax Romana, and it did last a few hundred years. 
But ultimately, that peace did not last either. Part of the problem is that we wonder, we, have, we don't have the right definition of peace. The Hebrew word used for peace, translated peace in Isaiah 9, in verse, verses 6 and 7, is of course shalom. And shalom means far more than just the absence of war, the absence of conflict. And it's kind of like the Hawaiian word aloha, meaning that it means many different things all rolled into one word. And the meaning of shalom includes peace. It also means health and wholeness and harmony and prosperity and blessing and many other things. All of those are rolled into the word shalom, which in this NIV translation that I read is translated peace. This is what shalom looks like. That's my father and my son. My son is sleeping peacefully. There is nothing like the peace of a child sleeping because they have complete trust and no concern in the world. Even when they're teenagers. Well, I'm not so sure about that, but okay. This is what shalom looks like. This is what rest looks like. So our theme for the Advent season this year is is Christ in the pandemic. And how do we find peace in a pandemic? According to the Centers of Disease Control, anxiety is up 300% this year. And depression is up 400%. And among unpaid caregivers, in other words, people taking care of their own family, suicidal thoughts are up 300%. Drug alcoholism, drug abuse are also way up. And according to the FBI, after many years of decline, murder and non-negligent homicide, in other words, deliberate killings of different kinds, are also up 15% this year. So it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of peace in the pandemic. Our society, in a sense, is coming apart at the seams, and the pandemic has made it so much worse. So where do we find peace? If you're a Buddhist, you try to find peace in nirvana, which basically consists of emptying yourself of everything, because you are bad. If you can get rid of you, you can get rid of the bad, and whatever is left will be peace. Yeah, does that work? No. Do we get peace from our government? Known as Big Brother. Uh, not anywhere that I have lived. Do we get peace from drugs and alcohol and gambling and sex and buying Christmas presents and taking trips to Hawaii? No, we don't get peace from that either. Part of the problem is is we're asking the wrong question. We're asking, where do we find peace, or how do I get peace? When the question we should be asking is, who is peace? Not, where is peace? Isaiah told us in the passage I read in chapter 9, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be called the Prince of Peace. And certainly we know this will be true after Jesus returns to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. Both Isaiah and Micah, in almost identical words, tell us that all war will be ended when he sets up his kingdom and that the swords will be beaten into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. In other words, the implements of war will be made into implements of agriculture. So in that sense, yes, he is the Prince of Peace. But what about right now? Jesus' kingdom is sometime into the future. We don't know when. Sometimes it seems like it's getting closer and closer, which it is. But what about right now? Now, if we turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul had some things to say about this. I'm going to read part of the chapter and skip over things here and there. This is Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So, 
we start out dead. Don't worry about peace. You're just dead when you start out. But God and his love and his mercy made us alive in verses 4 through 7. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So we were dead, but God made us alive. And all this was accomplished by Jesus at the cross. And in fact, nothing that we do or nothing that we have ever done has done us any good in the eyes of God. Our righteousness, as it says elsewhere, is like filthy rags. We can do nothing on our own. And Paul hammers that in this passage. By grace you are saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. Even the faith that is not our own faith, it comes from God as well. All that was done to save us was accomplished by Jesus at the cross. And then skipping down to verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised <coughs> by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Paul was writing to Greeks in the city of Ephesus. These were Greeks who had no Judeo-Christian heritage. They were pagans. And Paul's reminding them that when they came to God, they had nothing. They didn't even have the hope that Jews have of the covenant of Abraham. We Gentiles come to God with nothing. But Jesus came to preach peace. In verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, in other words, Gentiles who were far away from God, and peace to those who were near, that is, the Jews that Jesus came to physically. Jesus began with the Jews, but his ministry was not limited to them. And in fact, in order to fulfill the full promise to Abraham that the entire world will be blessed, Jesus' ministry expanded to the Gentiles, which is to say us. We are included in that. Now, back to verse 14, I'm backing up. For he, Jesus, is himself our peace, who has made the one, made the two one, that is the great divide between Jews and Gentiles, and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. In other words, even though the Jews had the law, it ultimately didn't change them. They only obeyed it, and, and even that not too well. We are outside of the covenant completely, and yet Jesus in some way brings peace between us and the Jews, and brings peace between us and God, and brings peace between the Jews and God. He brings peace to all of his children, no matter where they come from, whatever color of skin or whatever parents they had, Jesus brings peace to us. Note that this is in present tense. Jesus is our peace. Not that he was our peace and not that he brought us peace. He is our peace. And this is independent of our circumstances. Jeline and I are reading a, a devotional book for Advent. And I forget the author. Scott Daniels, that's right. And he mentions that Stephen, the martyr, was at peace even as he was being stoned to death. He said, don't lay this against them as the rocks were hitting him. He was in peace even when he was being killed. Years ago, I saw a movie about Nero, the Roman emperor. And I tried to find it to show you a clip of it, but I cannot find it. But in this movie, Rome, Nero has had Christians put to death in the Colosseum. 
And then at night, after everybody has gone away and the Colosseum is empty, he's out there with a torch looking at the bodies left of the Christians who have been killed by the animals and the gladiators. And he notices that the faces are all smiling. And he can't understand that. Nero cannot understand why the Christians that he murdered are smiling. And that is because they are at peace. And that peace is not dependent on their circumstances. So how then do we find peace in the pandemic? And verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 2 is the key. Let me read it to you. For through him we, have, we both, that is Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by one spirit. Through Jesus we have access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty good explanation of how the Trinity works. The Father commands, Jesus carries it out, and the Spirit mediates for us. This is how we find peace in the pandemic, through God's Holy Spirit. Last week, Ron Jr. talked about hope. And hope is the forerunner and the good friend of peace. Hope will actually bring us peace if we don't feel it right now. Our hope in Christ helps us in our trials and tribulations and persecutions, even in this pandemic. And in closing, I want to read what what Jesus said to his disciples as he was preparing to leave this earth. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Because of hope... And because of Jesus, we can have peace. And now we're going to celebrate communion. Already gotten your elements. They're on the back table. You're welcome to get them. And remember, there's a little film on the top. There, it's the same little point that they come off of. And you take a little film off of the top to reach the, the uh, bread. And then after we have partaken of the bread, then you peel off the next set to get the juice or wine. We are all looking forward to Pat's juice and doing things the way we are used to (laughs) soon. Jesus said something very troubling. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And The idea of it is repulsive. In fact, they said, how can this be? But we understand by what Jesus taught us that he himself is the bread of heaven that came out of heaven for manna for them to eat in the desert. We understand him to be our sustenance even now. When when he was tempted in the desert, he was, he was encouraged to make bread out of the stones so that he would no longer be hungry. And he said, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And don't forget that the word of God became flesh and lived among us. And because he did that, he was able to save us. And this is what we celebrate today. One of the things I want you to have in your mind's eye is that that feast we're looking forward to in heaven. Everybody that is following Jesus will be there. It will be fantastic. I look forward to that feast and I look forward to seeing you there with me as we celebrate with Jesus. And when we partake of this feast at the Lord's table, it is a foretaste of, I mean, only a tiny little taste of how fantastic it's going to be to be with him 
at the, at the Lord's table in, in his kingdom that Phil talked about today. So let us take the wafer. Let us remember that the Lord suffered for us. Let's break it in half and covenant to suffer with him for his sake and take it in remembrance of our Lord. Then we have to peel off the, really carefully the, other, the next part. It's hard not to spill. And this represents the blood of Christ. Still a mysterious act that we do. Not understood by anybody that doesn't know God and the, his church. But because of Jesus' command to take this in remembrance of him, we drink this, remembering what he did for us to save us. In Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we want to partake with you. You told your disciples when they were trying to be the the most important disciples you had, you asked them if they could drink your cu the cup that you were going to drink, and they said, yes, we can. And he said, and you will. That's the cup of suffering. You didn't promise that everything would be perfect for us. You promised that if we chose you, we might have to go through some suffering. And many of us have seen that. We've seen suffering in our lives, and we don't even know the extent of it. But for your glory, Lord, we lay our suffering at your feet and we lay our crowns at your feet and we give you all glory and honor and praise. Thank you for being our saving Savior and our glorious Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. benediction I want to say the Lord bless you and keep you may he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace you are dismissed thank you <laughs>